In this 1993 episode of The Simpsons, a fast-talking salesman showcased the futuristic wonders of the monorail to the city of Springfield. I give you the Springfield monorail! <gasps> but Marge picked up on the scam. How much did you see? Uh, nothing incriminating. The monorails he coveted left other cities in shambles. Looking back, it's easy to see how Springfield residents were so easily duped into the monorail concept. Not only does it offer a better view than your underground subway, but monorails require minimal ground space and are usually less expensive to build than a comparable elevated rail line. But in America today, you'll find that most monorails are only in airports and at Disney World. Some cities in Asia use them as part of their public transit system, but there are still only 75 in operation worldwide. So there you have what many experts say is the train of the future. Swift and sure it is, but one word of caution, please do not get off between stations. The monorail was a staple of the futuristic depiction of modern transit, but it never truly got off the ground. What happened? The monorail, as its name implies, runs on a single rail and is mainly used for passenger transport. Its most common form is what we see at Disney World, where it runs on an elevated track by itself. Despite being a symbol of modernity, the concept has been around for a while. In fact, the first monorail prototype was built in Russia in 1820 by Ivan Kirillovich Ilmanov. This primitive monorail consisted of a carriage with wheels on a center rail drawn by horses. <laughs> the first half of the 20th century saw all sorts of proposed designs for the monorail in the US including a 1930 proposal for New York City as a replacement for elevated lines. But like most monorail proposals, it was never built. American cities instead chose to test the types of light rail transit instead of the unproven monorail. But the novelty of the monorail is what was so enticing to Walt Disney. In the mid-1950s, Disney and his wife Lillian were on vacation in Cologne, Germany, when a hanging monorail swooshed by overhead. The Wuppertal monorail is one of the first of its kind, beginning trips in 1901, but to Walt Disney, it was cutting edge. It was the perfect form of transport for his Disneyland park. And so, in 1959, the Disneyland monorail became the first daily operating monorail system in the U.S. Today, you can find a monorail system in both Disneyland and Disney World. The Walt Disney World monorail carries about 150,000 guests per day. It's beloved by visitors and still looks modern 60 years later. But the system is more like a ride and was not built with efficiency in mind. Part of the reason monorails have been less successful is because the technology tends to build, like Walt Disney through the swamps of Orlando, to build them on pylons above grade as a sort of isolated system. And that separates it from a lot of other modes. They get structured as, you know, these you know shiny for-profit enterprises that will pay back their investors, et cetera, et cetera. Really, you know, really, it needs to be, you know, integrated with other modes. It actually needs to go places people want to go. It needs to have a critical mass around it. There, it's not a question of the monorail technology itself failing, but more the notion of, like, it was a monorail to nowhere. However, there are functioning monorails in other parts of the world. Most can be found in Asian megacities, like Chongqing, Shanghai, Tokyo, and Mumbai. The Tokyo monorail has over 300,000 daily riders, and the Chongqing Rail Transit with 900,000. The reason that Asian megacities, I think, tend to do better with the monorail is mainly because they have such a crunch of space. Because their cities are so packed with people, so dense with buildings, traffic, stuff like that, they kind of build vertically, right? So if you can't build out anymore because of sprawl, you can build up. They also have people who are more interested and willing to take public transportation, much more so than, than in the U.S. And while monorails have seen success in some parts of the world, there are just as many, if not more, instances of failure. Mumbai, India's first monorail, opened in 2014 to a disappointing turnout of just only 17,000 daily riders. The initial projection estimated up to 300,000 per day. The Melaka monorail in Malacca, Malaysia, originally opened in 2010, but hours after opening, the monorail ground to a halt, stranding 20 passengers inside. When it reopened in December 2017, a local newspaper criticized the monorail and use of funding. This monorail moves at 20 kilometers per hour. It's definitely not a mode of transportation that the locals can opt for, 
Why would they pay so much to ride on a monorail that travels to nowhere, critics told the paper. The monorail can be a functional form of transit, but its construction is often deterred by these three main issues. One, the monorail has trouble changing tracks. Track crossovers are integral to train operations, but monorail trains wrap themselves around the track, which makes track crossovers expensive to build and slow to operate. Two, it can get expensive. Take the Las Vegas monorail, for example. The 650 million 3.9 mile track was first opened in 2004 and runs parallel to the strip. During its initial pitch, promoters anticipated upwards of 20 million riders a year. The train was built to carry 222 people, but only had 4.9 million rides taken in 2016. According to the city's visitor bureau, nearly 43 million people visited Las Vegas in 2016, and the city's population runs at about 632,000. You do the math. And in 2010, the Las Vegas Monorail Company filed for bankruptcy. In effect, the monorail is not popular because it's so expensive. And it's so expensive because it's not popular. You have to think of how few monorails are in the world. And as a consequence of that, how much more expensive parts, trains, the rails themselves, like how much more expensive things are when they're scarcer to purchase. Bombardier, which is like, a major train maker or like Alstom, which is an, another major train maker based in Europe, like they, they're not like pumping out monorail cars and they're a specialized car, but they do make two track cars all the time. So you could get a better price for buying those types of trains. And finally three, it comes down to urban design. The US is designed more as an urban sprawl, which creates endless suburbs, which results in people being dependent on automobiles rather than public transportation like buses, subways, or light rail lines. The U.S. public transportation consistently has lower ridership, fewer service hours, and longer wait times between trains compared to wealthy European and Asian countries. Anything that gets more people using public transit in the U.S. is really critical. But the thing with converting people into transit users, it's not just making it available. You have to also do a lot of education. You have to do a lot of work to inform people about how transit works, how it will make their lives easier, how it will make their lives more affordable. And that takes a lot of political will from cities. And a lot of cities don't have the political will to do that. And regardless of where they're built, a monorail can be quite disruptive to everyday city life. Admittedly, monorails are, you know, much quieter, you know, than, than the L's of New York City's subway system. But I think, you know, that the unintended consequences can be the same in that they do, you know, dis they can be disruptive to street life, you know, from a design perspective. An elevated rail line, yes, it's efficient in that it's above the traffic, right? But now you've taken inhabitants of a city and put them above where the activity is, and that's on the street, and that's where the lifeblood of cities are. That's, you know, those are our arteries for our economy and for, you know, our social life, being human beings. The monorail system has had cases of success in cities across the world, but most of America's monorails remain in theme parks and airports. And while their nostalgia may bring people back to their childhood, their novelty hasn't resulted in the implementation of functional system in our cities. Disney's vision for the future might take a bit longer than he thought. Thanks for watching. Do you think monorails are the way of the future? Comment below. If you like this video, make sure to check out our channel and subscribe.